Hey, pals, you know what you should do? You should come hang out with us on Facebook. Go check out our Facebook page, facebook.com slash go with the heat. Come hang out with us. Come talk to us. Let's talk to 80s. Let's talk Miami Vice. Let's talk to greatness that when Miami Vice was king. And you know what? While you're at it, you should go check out the website, go with the And you could find those brand new feeds that we just set up exclusively for this week in Vice and the music segment only feed. Also, shoot us an email, go with the heat at gmail.com. Let us know what you think about this episode that you're hearing right now. We would love to hear from you. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. And also let us know, we're tossing around the idea of doing some live watch parties using Discord. Let us know, would you be interested in doing something like that? Hanging out with us while we live watch one of the episodes and we can all chat as we go through this episode. But pals, instead of talking about how you can come hang out with us, why don't we just stop acting like chumps and get on with the show? Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about season three, episode 18, titled Lend Me Your Ear, which is, I just, I've been laughing the entire time with this name of this episode. <laughs> <laughs> I see what they did there. <laughs> They're clever. It originally premiered on February 27th, 1987. It is written by Dick Wolf, so that might explain why I actually really enjoyed this episode. The catch that I'm going to get to at the very end of this. <laughs> I felt like this episode was needed a Law & Order episode after it. <laughs> yeah, to figure out what happened really, what really happened after. Yeah, you, well, you know, to, to try to see if the DA was going to try and prosecute Duddy or not. <laughs> it was directed by James Quinn, who has two more episodes coming in one in this season, one in the future. So he'll also direct Viking Bikers from Hell and Amen Send Money. The big thing is that he's also the assistant director on 11 other episodes. Yeah, so he's everywhere. Yeah, he is really, really experienced with Miami Vice. <laughs> Before we get started, I can check in and see what's going on in each other's lives. Guys, Melissa went and saw Thor Ragnarok over the weekend without me, jerk. <laughs> hey, you told me to go. It was a birthday <laughs> gift to our son. That's what he wanted to do. Can I say no? <laughs> but you know, we like to talk about the 80s here. And I think, Melissa, the only reason why you went and saw Thor Ragnarok wasn't for a Hemsworth. No, it's not for Hemsworth. No. <laughs> it was for an uh, 80s uh, uh. star that we are well familiar with he was one of the reasons okay. <laughs> jeff goldblum yes i do love jeff goldblum the ads hype him up to be pretty funny in that movie how is he really he is really funny he's one of the one of the funniest parts of the movie i would say and he's got a big he's got a pretty big role he's he plays the grand master of a planet and he's the one that puts together fights at his that's how he entertains his people he's like a big partier that's what his thing is <laughs> i mean I mean, and you know, I love Jeff Goldblum, mostly because of The Fly. Now, he's yeah. been in a ton of great stuff. And most recently, my favorite thing that he's in is The Grand Budapest. Yeah, he's good in that, too. But The Fly with, with Cronenberg and the practical effects and really turning, like, making a fly out of a rubber suit. Like, mm -hmm. it's, it's the best. And a naked Jeff Goldblum. Yep. <laughs> 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 He's naked in that movie, okay? I, I always enjoyed the fact that Goldblum never seemed to like t uh, take himself too seriously. The older he's gotten, the more he's willing to make fun of stuff and to just generally be funny. He's got you a know? bunch of uh, movies still coming, too. I heard a little bit, because I know they're making another Jurassic Park, and I heard something that he might make a guest appearance in it. I don't know. He is officially in. They have him listed here at... In Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom as Dr. Ian Malcolm. Well, he so, makes it out of the. Yeah, sense. he's he's actually re reprising his role from the original. He's in that new Wes Anderson, the animated one. Yeah. He's in that one, which I really want to see, The Isle of Dogs. How do we make it so that Jeff Goldblum and Wes Anderson just continue to churn out movies? Like one a year. If we're getting a more multiple Marvel movies a year, how do we get Wes Anderson to put out one a year? Yeah, I know. <laughs> well let's go talk about this episode because one of the things that i really really love about this episode is that they go way out on a limb to talk about technology and maybe go a little bit too far and have to pull them back in so the episode opens up with one of my favorite things of miami and florida planes literally take off and land Anywhere and everywhere. It is a nightmare in the skies <laughs> around Florida with planes just flying in every which direction. And they even land in the water right next to your boat. <laughs> yeah, they just, they just <laughs> land anywhere. <laughs> it, it, it's like an opening to an episode of Wings. <laughs> 
in comes this big plane. It lands. A boat comes pulling up to it. The duo are watching from a distance. And this plane is making me very uncomfortable because not only does it have no flight plan sent to the local airport, and it can land literally anywhere and then just take off again without having to report to anyone. But when they land and they show the pilot, he is his window is extremely close to the surface of the water. <laughs> Something tells me a really mm-hmm. light airplane won't do so well with a little bit of water inside of it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just love Tubbs and Crockett in this opening because they're sitting in a boat, you know, just two friends boating in suits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's how everyone boats in their three-piece suit. <laughs> Can't be too formal on a boat. Um, they're watching. It, it almost seems like Crockett's perturbed a little bit that the drug deal is taking this long. Yeah, like, let's speed this thing up. Come on. <laughs> and they see an exchange of briefcases, and then the plane just takes off, and the boat that pulled up takes off too. And Crockett just says, "Okay, here we go," and it turns into a chase. Like, so the people there knew the entire time that they were police and still did their deal or something? Like, No, they didn't know they were there. That's just They just started following them. Breakneck speeds. <laughs> oh, my favorite part of Miami Vice is when Tubbs has to ride in a boat because he's got, <laughs> clearly terrified. <laughs> he's like gritting his teeth he the whole time. He's he, like sweating bullets. Like he really is terrified. <laughs> I mean, I know he Crockett clearly is a crazy hates driver. this part. <laughs> yeah he does like they didn't pay yeah. him enough to be in this role clearly in that boat <laughs> and don't make sure right. crockett just takes off into a boat chase you know like, like it was planned planes are greater than boats in chases so <laughs> <laughs> hey you know what don johnson cannot help it he is a boat champion and he has to show his driving skills his <laughs> sorry his boating skills it, my, so my the plane gets away <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> let's just make that clear right now the plane gets away but yeah. the other boat almost gets away but then hits a road <laughs> you know those pesky roads that get in your way when you try and jump them <laughs> my two favorite parts of this chase is one tubs is not trying really hard to throw up during the entire chase <laughs> don't throw up don't throw up don't throw up <laughs> And two, that it takes place through a neighborhood. And I just imagine that Sonny does this for fun on yeah. the weekends. He hauls ass through people's <laughs> neighborhoods, blowing by <laughs> Castillo's house on the weekend. <laughs> Castillo just comes running out. Maverick! Yeah. <laughs> he goes, I said no flybys. <laughs> It's like those weird neighborhoods where they have their own dock and stuff. It's like we're supposed to be really peaceful. You're not supposed to speed through there in your speedboat. Mm-hmm. Get out there on your pontoon. Some speedboat just comes over and knocks you over. John, like you were saying, the chase ends with the boat going airborne onto a road. I guess they just ran out of water. <laughs> just going too fast. Yeah, airborne water. onto the road. The duo comes up, guns drawn, find a dead person inside of the boat. The other person that was in the boat originally is now gone, and so are the briefcases. But mysteriously, how did he get out? Because we saw the boat land, and here was no one getting out. No one saw anything. Weird. And then we head to the opening credits. When we come back from the opening credits, we're at the precinct and explaining to Castillo what happened. It's like, I don't know. We just lost him. He just disappeared. I don't know. Uh, we didn't see him get out. Why are you asking Crockett- me? I'm not a cop. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> it, Crockett is convinced that our bad guy in this episode, Dykstra, was there because he saw two guys in the boat. And that other person is gone. And Lucardo is dead. Yeah. He's the one that was part of this deal. He was the big time dealer that they were also following too. So they got Dykstra and Lucardo, but Lucardo is dead now. Oh yeah, he's definitely dead. <laughs> Switek says that they, he got all the information from the tap, so he's not sure what happened. This is the way that he had heard it on their wiretap, so there's no reason for him to suddenly disappear or some second boat that he got onto or something like that. They walk out Castillo's office and sandwiched in the middle of this is Sonny not being able to get a loan. Yeah. <laughs> Would you give a loan? <laughs> he got no collateral. He doesn't own anything. How's he going to get a loan? No. He literally lives on a boat under a, an assumed name. The boat is technically in Sonny Burnett's name, Enterprising Criminal. It's, well, technically, actually, the boat, you will know later on it, the show, they come and they try and take the boat. It's not even in his name. It's in Miami Dade. Because he couldn't get a loan. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it was repo. No. Yeah, because not, nothing is in his name because it's not his. None of it, that's his stuff. He's like, down, remember he said later on in the episode, down to my shoes, it's not even my stuff. It, well, he, and he pays for everything in cash. And so Sonny Crockett lives like a drug dealer. He pays for everything in cash. He uses yes. and lives and stuff that's not his. <laughs> Which is funny because I bet you Sonny Burnett could get a loan. <laughs> yeah, I know. 
We know you, you're a lucrative drug dealer. We'll give you the money. Uh, you're on that boat. We have a quick stop over at Dykstra's house. He's talking to Leon, and Dykstra is concerned that they have a leak because of the events that was happening this morning. And then we just get a quick glance at his girlfriend, who is wearing amazing sunglasses. <laughs> you want those sunglasses. <laughs> then we go to a quick driving scene where Sonny is complaining that you can't get a loan, but every time, but they're always busting millionaires. So is Sonny Burnett, the drug dealer, jealous of successful drug dealers? <laughs> <laughs> Be a better drug dealer. <laughs> the most important thing here is that they're heading out to Izzy's. Izzy's doesn't feel good, though. <laughs> he got the sniffles. <laughs> but I was so distracted by that chair with, like, the Cadillac tail light. <laughs> uh, yeah, no. His house is decorated very strangely. <laughs> Izzy is so sick, he says, quote, any altercations to the barometric system disrupt my paranasal digestive system. And then he dips a cigarette in Vicks. Which, by the way, it's like a genius idea. Like, think about it. You could just I get, know. Meant that you could get your nose cleared and have a cigarette at the same time. You, you guys laugh, but I think I'm going to try that. Switch over to menthols when you got sniffles. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Tubbs and Crockett are looking through Izzy's stuff, too, and they're like, like Tubbs holding up something, and Crockett holds up something else. I'm like, don't you guys remember? He's a stripper. Crockett held up those underwear with stockings built into it. <laughs> they were like zebra print underwear and then like stockings. Like, what the? Also, once again, Tubbs looks really bored. He's like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing here. His legs crossed, hand on his legs, like whatever. Well, what they're doing there is they're trying to find out about a 200 million frog skin deal. <laughs> Which is obviously a huge deal. You would think that Miami Vice would know a little bit more about that. And turns out they did. But is the only information that Izzy is able to give them is that the double cross and killing Lucardo was part of the original plan. And that's the end of Izzy, unfortunately, for, for this episode. Can't wait for mm-hmm. episodes where Izzy is an integral part throughout the entire thing and not just these little one-offs. Yeah, I know. It's coming, though. So but- I just want to start this next scene for us. So we go to Zoytech trying to learn magic in the van. All by himself <laughs> trying to learn how to disappear. It's so sad. <laughs> that hurt my heart. He has no one. He's like in there by himself. He has no one to talk to. No one to eat hot dogs with. He's just got to learn magic. <laughs> he's trying to make himself Having a friend. Having to pick his own card. <laughs> he's, he's trying to, to magically make a friend appear. Like someone who cares about me. <laughs> this is outside of Dykstra's house. And so inside, this is where we meet Duddy. Miami Steve is also what he goes by. <laughs> in, he is dancing around and he's looking for wiretaps inside of the house for Dykstra. But he is having a great time while he's doing it. And also, you say, you mentioned while we were watching the episode that all the experts in Miami Vice are weirdos. Why? Why are they weirdos? Like when they go to Chris, when Chris Elliott plays the guy that can decode things and he lives in the plane. Why? Like, why do they got to be weirdos? Why can't they just be normal? Uh, why is everyone they contract out to strange? And they're all and, and um, Crockett knows them all. He's like, oh, yeah, this guy. I remember him. I worked with him before. Like, here's the best guy to go to. How many people do you know? <laughs> and he does find the vice team's bugs that are inside of the house. He even burns them out. He connects the device to the phone line. He burns out the wiretaps that the vice team have so now he's burned up all evidence that the vice team could ever collect now he also offers to extra that he's got some tools for prices too like voice scramblers and changers and stuff like that what's interesting about having duddy in this episode is that i feel like vice has someone on staff for this kind of role so and you know in the past they have they had a guy policeman named lester costco who was their resident electronics expert. He was played by Julio Oscar Machoso, and he appeared in the episodes Heart of Darkness, Cool Running, One-Eyed Jack, No Exit, Milk Run, and The Golden Triangle Part 2. Damn, he owns season so, one. <laughs> yeah, dude, all over the place. What is amazing that in Vice fashion, he actually shows up in this episode, but not as Policeman Lester Costco. He shows up as... Tommy, which was an uncredited role, and then he will appear again in the episode Badge of Dishonor, where he's going to play a drug dealer named Escobar. So, from cop to drug dealer, in a matter of three seasons. 
<laughs> He's got a hard life, apparently. <laughs> uh, Things went downhill. It went real bad fast. for him fast. <laughs> Duddy is played by John Glover, who has 110 acting credits. And I mean, there are some some bigger projects. Uh, he was in Annie Hall. He was in the movie Scrooge. Yes, uh, that's where was... I'm like remembering it from Scrooge. He's the mm-hmm. like the other director they bring in. There we go. He was also in Gremlins 2 and in the Batman and Robin movie. Terrible. <laughs> um, <laughs> Terrible. He's Terrible. made a bunch. He's made a bunch of guest appearances in TV. The big one is he was nominated for an Emmy for his portrayal of Lionel luther on smallville man's been around he's been around a few Mm -hmm. times (laughs) well we head over to the precinct and just real fast they tell cassie about how the taps that they've been made and this is when melissa you said that crockett recommends that they go talk to miami steve who's already working for dyke show but this is who that they this is who they should go talk to so that's where we bounce to next we head out two duddies where the duo are going to go talk to him i'm not gonna spend too much time on this scene either because it's really weird but (laughs) We'll mention it, it, that they come into the house, the door is open, Duddy's laying on the ground, and then the TV turns on, and it's Duddy saying hi to Crockett, and then then Duddy sits up off the ground, and the TV recorded version and real Duddy just start laughing in unison, and then we cut to commercial. Yeah, this guy's annoying. I I, kind of wanted someone to shoot him (laughs) about this exact scene. (laughs) Yeah, he thinks he's really funny, too. That's the thing about him. He's not, but he thinks he is. He thinks he's... (laughs) (laughs) What I really want to get to is just where they go. So they go to lunch. (laughs) I know where you're going with this. (laughs) And I'm I'm going to mention first what I... I noticed it, and but then... I, before I could bring it up, Melissa, you were like, what the hell is Tubbs eating? <laughs> Why is he just eating like a honeydew melon? It's a whole honeydew. It's a whole <laughs> me- melon. Like, <laughs> they're eating like lunch and there he is with a freaking melon. And then he, it's like cut in half and he's eating it with like a knife and fork. And around the melons, like sliced apples. What the hell is going on? It's the true test of being a vegetarian and trying to go to a restaurant. They're like, just give him something. I don't know. We got a melon back here. Uh Cut it up and give it to him. He'll eat it. (laughs) Everything else on the menu had chicken in it. It's either that or it's got eggplant or sweet potato in it. (laughs) (laughs) The other thing that really stood out to me in this scene is Duddy's little speech that he gives. So him and Tubbs and Crockett are talking and Tubbs and Crockett making jokes about him. You know, how does he sleep at night by be knowing all these things that are possible and helping people listen in on conversations and stuff like that. And he says he just gets emotionally detached, just like police officers, just he doesn't have to see dead bodies. So like, ha ha ha, that's like a little laugh. But then Duddy goes into this story where he talks about that the biggest drawback for him is this constant paranoia that anyone could be listening at any time because he mentioned several times throughout the episode that your communication is not private anymore based on today's communication standards and and all the technology that exists it's not secure so he knows all that but also makes him constantly paranoid he knows how easy the systems are to break and there's a lot of parallels here between this and modern computer hacking because this is a problem for white hat hackers or black hats who will switch over to do white hat hacking. They know like what the possibilities are and how insecure software is. And so they live with this level of paranoia. So I just wanted to point out like that there's this extreme parallel between the 80s and telephones and the 2010s and computers. Duddy then gets a page and he runs off when he pays for lunch. He just drops 100 <laughs> on the table and he t- disappears. Well, yeah, because they're talking about how it must be nice, all the money he makes. He's like, yeah, it's all right. And he drops 100 and leaves. <laughs> <laughs> so they head over to the precinct and D- Duddy is there. And they're going through all the options with, with the equipment. And Gina's really confused by Duddy's pen. And Duddy just doesn't miss a beat. He's like, yeah, I use it to get your number. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Nope. I love how Teddy's sitting here going over all the the equipment and everything with the vice team. He gives them this whole sales pitch at the very end. He's like, like you guys are paying me, right? <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't for free. <laughs> Switek so doesn't hey, look man, happy it, about yeah. this situation though. No, because he's the guy that does all the surveillance stuff. It's like a big it's a big shot to him, right? Like you're crap. You can't do this good. <laughs> we need to call in an expert. We you you're he has no friends. Go back to pulling got- rabs out of hats. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's got no friends. He can't do magic. <laughs> they eventually settle on that they're gonna rent some equipment from Duddy and then they're gonna go place it. So we head out to Dykstra's that night. And the team's going to sneak in and plant these couple radios that 
Duddy had recommended. And when I mean sneak in, they literally bust the lock, <laughs> spray for lasers, and climb it all the way into the house. Okay, but if the guy has lasers, let's address this. He lives on the freaking water. <laughs> they drive their boat up to the house. <laughs> Does he not have cameras that like video record outside of his house? Anybody could just drive their boat right up to your house and come in. <laughs> also, he doesn't the lock more, the door. It, they just they the come more in. Important it's not thing. locked. <laughs> The more important thing on my mind is, did you guys hear the Pink Panther music in your head during this scene? <laughs> it's also hilarious that that um, Tubbs makes Switek spray the laser so that Switek can go under. And then Tubbs just goes under it like, no problem. He's like, man, you're too big to get under there. So I'm like, I don't know. It's like, like you can't make it. <laughs> but I don't need the help. What was really creeping me out in the scene is that the guards look an awful lot like Duddy. And all three of them look very similar. It's like everyone in this episode looks the same. <laughs> yeah, dude, that is weird. And the cards are really, they're just acting weird, too. Like that one guy sitting there playing with his gun, like pointing it at, at the other guy. And, you know, and they're like hanging out in some like conference room off to the side. <laughs> oh. And then they almost get busted because so. of why Tech's ass. <laughs> okay, it needs yeah. help, okay? Sometimes it runs into uh, things. So- <laughs> All of the ninja stuff was sneaking in and ducking all the lasers and everything. They get away just in the nick of time to sneak out. All of that, and they're busted because the guy's ugly statue moved and, and, and is facing a different direction. Like, he immediately notices, hey, something's wrong with that ugly statue. <laughs> It's really ugly, but I need it to be facing the right direction. Before this night ends, Crockett does radio in to Gina and Trudy, and they have something really interesting here is to say that Dykstra has never been arrested for drugs. He's wanted basically all over the world for money, financial crimes. There's nothing for drugs. And so Crockett is like, there's something weird here. There's something, there's a part of the story we're not understanding yet. And also, why would he do business with big time dealers and then kill them? Yeah. Like in the case of Lucardo. And then the next yeah, morning. Yeah, but I mean, come on. True did the research, so it's got to be true. <laughs> I mean, yeah. This, if there was someone that you trust that's doing the research. Yeah, she's doing the research at night. Like, why is she still there? They're, this is at <laughs> night. <They're, laughs> they, they just make her stay at the office until they're done with their caper. <laughs> <laughs> And you're right. Gina and Trudy do all the legwork and they never get any of the credit. Like they present Crockett with all of the evidence that he needs to understand that Dykstra is not in the drug business. He's just dealing with drug dealers. And he hangs up the phone and he's like, that means Dykstra must not be doing business with drugs. Like, yeah, that's what Trudy told you. That's what she just said. (laughs) Uh, And I'm going to remind us of this scene in a little bit. Let's keep keep rolling through. I got my pages ready. (laughs) I'm shuffling my papers around. I'm ready to go. The next morning, this is when Dykstra notices that a statue's not right. He has Duddy come back in and do another sweep. Duddy finds the two bugs and he realizes they're his. They're the ones that he sold or is renting to the Vice team. And what I skipped over earlier was that Duddy used to work for the Miami PD. So when he finds them, he pulls one, but then fixes the other to make it better, but only so that he can hear it. Yep. You don't know that at the time, but that's yeah. what he's doing. He then. I, I just want to know why did he eat one? I don't know why he put it in his <laughs> mouth. I guess because he thought like that's the only safe place that they wouldn't find it. Maybe no, because that's the one that he can, shows. Can that Vice hear what he him. had for lunch? Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know. I guess it was just to make him look more believable because Dykstra comes downstairs in the middle of him finishing up patching that one that he's leaving. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so he's double crossing the Greek. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dykstra also points out like, hey, is that a fancy lie detector that you got there? Duddy's like, yeah, and it works really good too. So Dykstra takes it outside and uses it on his girlfriend. Like, you banging Joe? Yes. Yeah, she's like, no. And he's like, well, I don't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just like, can I borrow your lie detector? And if that's not weird enough, I'm going to borrow it so I can accuse my girlfriend of cheating. <laughs> It's also really weird poolside when this happens because it looks like Duddy is blocking the girlfriend from leaving. Yeah, it's really weird. And like, then, why is he there watching him do it? Yeah, then Dykstra shoots and kills her right in front of him. And she's not a very good actress. She was still swimming after she was dead. <laughs> I'm dead in the pool. She also wasn't face bleeding. Underwater. She was on her back. And like when they showed her, she was moving her hands trying to tread to stay. <laughs> she can't float that well. <laughs> <laughs> So I guess uh, Dykstra's single again. Maybe Duddy was there because he was the one that was hitting that. 
<laughs> Maybe. Teddy seems to be two steps ahead of everyone so far. So I mean, it wouldn't put I wouldn't put it past them being in the the <laughs> guy's girlfriend. So Duddy now finds himself in a weird spot because he used to work with the Miami PD. He just witnessed a murder, and he knows that the Miami Vice are bugging his house and so he goes home and makes a call to homicide to report the murder but using a voice changer trying not to involve himself while involving himself just a woman reporting a murder you mallet head <laughs> <laughs> at the precinct the team especially crockett are very upset with duddy because their taps don't work anymore duddy says that they can use a laser mic to get sound off a of window it's cheap it'll work but we know now he's kind of playing both sides but he wants dykstra to get caught so maybe the vice team should just listen to him he wants Dykstra to get caught but only if he can make two bills a day doing it <laughs> <laughs> i think the biggest key here is that the vice team never told duddy who they were bugging he figured it out on his own, and then he was also hired by Dykstra on his own, too. So for as much as Crockett wants to grandstand at the end of this episode, which he does a lot of, Duddy found himself accidentally in the middle here. And in the end, he does the right thing. Yes, okay, maybe he milks a government contract for a little extra money. Who doesn't? <laughs> he also mm -hmm. didn't get anyone killed. He, tr he tries to go the way without in directly involving himself to report the murder and get Dykstra arrested. And he says in this precinct scene it's like well i mean you got this evidence you should just go arrest them and the vice team makes a good point like we don't it's all circumstantial we don't have enough evidence to really be able to arrest them but duddy's really trying here without re revealing him to the vice team and to dyke or to dyke show that he's caught in the middle but more on that later i'm not saying anything i'm over here just like <laughs> <laughs> we have a fast scene with dykstra where he goes to meet with someone named mcgregor and this is his big deal. This is the one that he's been waiting for to happen. They, he's blindfolded, gets taken out to this boat dock, and you find out that there's all these bags, but it's not drugs. It's full of cash. So, John, I think this is alluding to the er – this is a step to the earlier scene, and then your big feedback which will come later when Crockett finally puts it all together himself. That yes. Dex was in the business of dealing cash, not drugs. We don't have to get to that now because we still haven't figured this out as far as the Vice Squad, even though <laughs> uh, Trudy figured this out a few scenes ago. Crockett's going to put it all together sometime around noon tomorrow. <laughs> quick stop at the precinct the team's listening to that duddy phone call from homicide my only part that i wanted to mention here is that the detective playing the tape said that he had a twinge and he looked up dykstra and saw that vice was working on him and the duo are like how'd you know about that and he's like the vice security sucks i was able to get <laughs> yeah, right dude, in that was my, <laughs> that, the, that, that was what i was gonna say is that like sunny and rico are like that is super classified. Like, how would you? He's like, my 13 year old could break the department code. The password's <laughs> guest. I'm like, come on, guys. We then have a quick scene of Duddy scene editing some recordings that he's done of Dykstra that of that tap that was left in the house. And then we also have really fast where we see Dykstra shoot and kill McGregor and push him into the water. So just like he did to Lucardo, he's now killed McGregor and he's going to keep the money. This is the type of person that Dykstra is. Yes. And we also see that Duddy's van is much nicer than for his white tax. <laughs> <laughs> Out at Dykstra's house, D Duddy shows up and he takes that edited conversation and he plays it on the glass so that Switek can hear it through that laser mic that's pointed at the window. And he hears this edited version of what Dykstra was saying in the house of him in the deal, but it's been edited to make it sound like a phone call. So, or like that Dykstra's there and, and it all flows together fine. So now the vice has everything they need to make a move on him. Switek hears it, he calls yeah. it in. And, and not to jump back, but did uh, when Dykstra shoots the other guy, why did that look like such a romantic evening? You know? <laughs> and that was kind of weird. Like we're strolling along the docks. Yeah. <laughs> and then they just, oh, and someone left us this champagne with two glasses. <laughs> Look, honey. <laughs> At the docks, the police have found the body of McGregor. Switek calls it into Castillo and says, quote, he was canal bobbing with a mouthful of lead. And I, I just want to point out something really fast. There's twice in this episode where they said someone got shot in the head, but they didn't say they got shot in the body. <laughs> just say it. Just, just saying, Vice. <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> On the drive back to, to the precinct, then at the precinct, Sonny shows up and he's complaining about how he does everything in cash, like we were talking about earlier. You live like a drug dealer, Sonny. 
That's why you can't get a loan. But then yes. it dawns on him. Dykstra's moving cash for dealers out of the country, but he's killing them and keep and then he's keeping it. You know, cash like me. I always deal in cash. Oh my god, I figured out this case. <laughs> I've cracked it wide open. <laughs> and two days ago, we were on the phone with Trudy, who was saying that <laughs> he has only been arrested for cash violations. <laughs> that that is it. The only connection he has with illegal activity is money. Money, Sonny. <laughs> two days ago. Money, money, money. <laughs> So then Sonny goes to talks to Switek, who has this tape now that Duddy made and played for the Vice team and set this up because he didn't know what was going to happen. But he just set this up so they can make a move on Dykstra. And Sonny's like, but the time when you recorded this doesn't make any sense because the coroner has Dykstra killing McGregor just an hour earlier. So the time doesn't match up here. And then he realizes then, hey, all our problems keep going back to tech changed voices burned out wiretaps time shifted conversations because when they heard the call into homicide they have a quick conversation with duddy where he says all i can tell you is that it sounds like the voice has been changed but now it dawns on crockett too it's like not only is this a cash deal and that's what dykstra does but also duddy seems to be the one every time we have a problem it goes back to something that involves him so let's go talk to duddy yeah they go over to his house and just gives crockett a few minutes to yell at him but duddy has a good point <laughs> It's like this, they would have nothing without him, and he didn't know whose side he was on. And this little shakedown that Vice is doing, I'm pretty sure they're paying Duddy for it. I'm pretty sure this is going to show up in his billables. <laughs> <laughs> At Dykstra's, they do all pull up, and they're talking to Dykstra, but another sweeper is there checking for bugs inside of the house. They muscle him, Crockett does, and he finds out that the bug that Duddy had left and had been listening to and used to edit that tape, Dykstra got paranoid because Dykstra, that's what Dykstra is. He's super paranoid throughout the entire episode, doesn't trust mm -hmm. anybody. He hires another sweeper to come in, and they find that Bill's one. Bill's bargain. <laughs> yeah, Bill's no. bargain counterintelligence man. <laughs> so now, of course, Dykstra's pissed, and he's going to go kill Duddy. So the vice team then run off to go save Duddy. We go over to Duddy's house, and Dykstra pulls up. It's nighttime now, so it took everyone a long time to get across town. I mean, it's... They yes. have a boat. Traffic, traffic. traffic midday in Miami is just... Oh. They had no boat, okay? They had to get there regular. <laughs> Duddy sees them pull up, and Dykstra says outside, quote, I want him to know who it is. I want to see him lose his water. Okay. All right. <laughs> how do you know he has water at all Duddy is armed he shoots one guard with a shotgun through the door and then the other bodyguard and Dykstra start going through the house to go kill Duddy in the meantime the vice team show up and Dykstra looks extremely calm for someone who's hunting another person with a shotgun knowing that the police are right outside Sonny shoots one of Dykstra's guys or well, the other one of Dykstra's guys and that is the longest roll downstairs I've ever seen <laughs> <laughs> and then Duddy does the same kind of TV trick that he did to Sonny earlier in the episode, and then pops out and shoots and kills Dykstra. And that's the end of Dykstra's hijinks. And three men, three armed men, broke into Duddy's house. And so when the vice team come running into Duddy's living room, Duddy holds out his gun like, look, it's not loaded. This is all done. And Sonny's like, listen here, pal, you're under arrest. And I'm like, Bleh, bleh, bleh. huh? This threw uh -huh. a huge left hook for me that I did not see coming, that Sonny was going to pull this, that Sonny was going to spring some, as Melissa, you call this, Sonny logic <laughs> on, on Duddy. I did not see this coming. I was so into this episode that they were using tech and that he was super, that the tech guy was really paranoid and he was kind of playing both sides because he didn't know where he actually stood with either team and he could get killed by Dykstra at any time. And then Sonny comes busting in and he arrests him after three armed men broke into his own house. Yeah, but I mean, what about all the stuff where he was making fake recordings and all that stuff? Like, it, he knew it was going to lead back to him. That's why he was at his house with the guns and his. that's why he's paranoid. The bottom line is people are dead. You can't just shoot people. You can't. You're not supposed to as a civilian. He's not a policeman anymore, which he was. He wasn't a contracted person. He was a policeman. 
So he knows the rules. He knows the laws. That's why he worked within them. And he said, I didn't do anything wrong. I was right. I skirted the law. But three armed men broke into his house. If there was ever a stand your ground state, it's Florida. I understand that. But three gro- three men broke into his house because he was playing both sides. Like if he, he didn't have to still be his bug man anymore, but he wanted the money. Yeah, but it doesn't matter because the <laughs> DA won't charge him. So he's going to get off. Exactly. But yeah. just for good measure, Crockett makes a video <laughs> and gets Zwitek to help him try and scare Steve, I guess. Just to play so, to his like, paranoia. Yeah. The video, like, Crockett pops on, like, you know what you did, Steve, you know? <laughs> and it's like, boo, I'm still not going to be charged. Okay, you're going to watch me now? Yeah, it just ends so, with saying that they'll be watching him, and then it freeze frames on Duddy's afraid face and that's the end of the episode and i have i have lots of opinions about how this episode ends like i said this episode was great i was all in on this episode throughout the entire thing except for like the last three minutes of this episode but i'm gonna save that for my final thoughts so let's go talk about the music in this episode and i'm really excited to hear about this week's music because we have a return a return musician (laughs) but in a different format (laughs) let's go talk about this week's music All right, Sean, I mentioned that we have a returning music artist, but when he was here, he wasn't a musician when he was in Vice. What do you got for us this week in music? We have the song Risk Yourself by Bruce Buck Buck Willis. Buck Buck. Who who appeared earlier in the show as a guest star, but now we have him in our music. I have to say, this set me off on a tangent looking up Bruce Willis music. And I was quite surprised at not only the volume of music and the range of music, but just how successful it was too. This particular song actually got all the way up to number five on the Hot 100. Give you a little bit of idea of background because we already talked about uh, Walter when he was a guest star as far as career wise. I want to talk about the music. At the time when he recorded this, he was starring on the TV show Moonlight. He was really just kind of coming out in in his own. This album, The Return of Bruno, which was released in 87 under the Motown label, it was a companion piece to an HBO special of the same name. That HBO special was a, a mockumentary starring Bruce as his alter ego, Bruno Gradolini, a legendary <laughs> blues singer. <laughs> who influenced a number of uh, musicians who actually appear in the film itself. Those musicians include El- Elton John, Phil Collins, Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys, John Bon Jovi, Paul Stanley A Kiss, the Bee Gees, and Ringo Starr, among others. Wow. It's listed as an eclectic gathering of R&B music. It's Bruce with backing musicians of Booker T. Jones, the Porner Sisters, and even the Temptations. That is a crazy cast and his involvement with some crazy people. They went all out for this. The album itself peaked at number 14 on the Billboard 200. As I said, the song uh, featured a duet with June Porner. Respect Yourself made it to number five. This is... My favorite, though, uh, mu- mu- reviews from critics were, were rather mixed, though. Uh, People Magazine gave it a B plus, but said it was surprisingly okay, and Willis can't shout songs quite as well as Don Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the last thing I'm going to say about it is it, it actually reminded me of Woody Allen flick from uh, 99 called Sweet and Low Down, which was a mockumentary of Emmett Ray, a 30s jazz guitarist played by Sean Penn. It, it's kind of funny. It reminded me of that movie, but now I'm kind of thinking like that movie was almost inspired by this in a way. Chris Willis, uh, much more musically inclined than I've ever given him credit for. That so, is a big rabbit hole to go down on YouTube too. I recommend it. If you have the time, it's kind of fun. Our next song is Climb by Peter Himmelman. Peter Himmelman is a Minnesota native singer, songwriter, film and TV composer. Played in the Minneapolis indie rock band Sussman Lawrence. Actually got their name from a character 
from a public access TV show called Steamroller, in which Peter Himmelman, uh, way back in the day, it, it, so in 1985, he got his first deal for his first solo record on Island Records. Sussman Lawrence Band became the Peter Himmelman Band, and he pretty much became his own solo act. He'd get regular rotation on MTV in the early 90s, and then pretty much moving on from the 90s would become known mostly for his work on in television and uh well his work in television i'm not gonna give he did form uh, film scores i didn't really recognize any real big film although i did enjoy the name he did the film score for uh the movie porn and chicken <laughs> so but he's actually as far as his tv work uh he was nominated for an emmy for his song Best Kind of Answer in 2002 that appeared on an episode of Judging Amy Himmelman, who was a composer for that, for the show. I like that um, show. <laughs> he also, he was also a composer for Bones on Fox, which is from seasons one to four, which, you know, in my opinion, was probably the best uh, as far as the music's concerned for that show. I'm a fan of Bones. He was Grammy nominated for his kids' album, My Green Pipe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and in 2011, he began working with the brands McDonald's, Gap, and Banana Republic to help them achieve better communication communication through innovation and leadership uh using songwriting so some kind of company that you know teaches leadership it was also the creative force and a live internet show called famous uh, furious world in 2000 that ran from 2008 to 2010 it featured live music with with his band video segments that range from philosophical to comedy so moving on we get to our third song called be my enemy by the water boy the water boys are an irish scottish folk rock band formed in Edinburgh in 1983 by Scottish musician Mike Scott. Scott released a number of uh, solo recordings in late 81 to early 82. Those solo recordings would actually lead to him forming the short-lived and the Red and the Black with future members of the Water Boys. So in 83, the label, who at the time was thinking they were getting a solo record, would actually get the first debut album of the Water Boys, formerly the Red and the Black. They would take the name of the band from a Lou Reed song called The Kids off the album Berlin. They would add keyboardist Carl Wallinger. Their early music, their first three albums, would be known as their big music stage. They would tour supporting bands like The Pretenders and U2. So in 85, Winston would leave to join the band China Crisis. The trio would add Wickham's on violin after hearing a demo he did with Sinead O'Connor. Kind of important because that would be as they released their third album, which sold better than the earlier two, but promotion efforts would be stalled when they would refuse to appear on the show Top of Pops because they didn't want to have to lip sync their song. So toward the end of this tour for that third album, Carl Wallinger would leave to start his own band called World Party. That would lead to the more reggae phase uh, or what they call the Graggle Taggle Band era. <laughs> of the Water Boys would begin with Wickham moving to Dublin and he would get super into traditional folk music and so their next few albums would be mixed among critics and it would eventually start the disillusion of the band. So going into the early 90s they would break up with Scott trying to go solo until the Scott would resurrect the band, but name only, because it would be him with a bunch of new members, occasionally releasing and touring all the way up until, two, I mean, even in 2015, he released a new album called Mo Modern Blues. Waterboy, still out there, still floating around, but just not the original members. So you remember when I was mentioning about that guy they hired who had worked with Sinead O'Connor? Yeah, and you were like, and he was in a band that other guy him. left to start his own bad th band. Yeah, yeah, I was like, huh, that name sounds really familiar. World Party. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Carl, Carl Wallinger from the Water 
Boys, we'd start World Party, who would be our next song in the episode, The Ballad of the Little Man. After leaving the Water Boys in 1986, Wallinger would start the band World Party. He would record his debut album, Private Revolutions, at his house. And it would end up yielding two minor hits in the UK, Private Revolution and the song Ship of Fools. But Ship of Fools, even though it was only a minor hit in the UK, would do much better internationally. It would reach number four in Australia, number 21 in New Zealand, and number 27 in the US, becoming its his only international hit. While recording his first and second album, though, he aided Sinead O'Connor in recording her debut album, the 1998 The Lion and the Cobra. The then unknown O'Connor would guest appear on both of World Party's first and second albums because of it. There's a lot of crossover so, you here. You see there? You see? <laughs> yeah, quite a bit of crossover. World Party, it may not have been huge success, still launched the career of Sinead O'Connor. Honor. Wallinger continued to release albums, it, but with mostly just success in the UK. And then after he would take a three-year hiatus to pursue solo projects away from World Party, he would actually suffer an aneurysm in 2001 that would leave him unable to speak. After five years of rehab, he would re-emerge on the scene, playing his first show in almost a decade at the festival South by Southwest in 2006. And they just pick up right where he left off. That in is 2000, crazy. he would tour in support of Steely Dan. It's really cool that he was able, after an aneurysm left him without being able to speak, he was able to respond like that. In 2007, he toured in support of Steely Dan during their Australian leg of their tour. In 2009, he would tour the West Coast doing shows like Bumper Shoot. And in 2012, he would release like the world party ultimate collection still making music there, there you have our music there was way more crossover in this music segment than i thought there was going to be i was like i saw the lists of bands and i'm like this is all weird i don't know what any of these people are and then it turns out they're like they all know each other <laughs> and it yep. all goes back to bruce willis somehow <laughs> big thank you to bruce willis for managing the drag phil collins back into my music uh, thank you <laughs> All right, well, let's go talk about our final thoughts on this episode. I'm not sure where everyone stands, so let's go talk this one out. All right, Melissa, what are your final thoughts on this episode? I have mixed emotions on this episode. I don't think this episode is great. <laughs> I think it's good. I don't I'm not have a particular interest in the the wiretapping and the you know, the bugging and all that portion of it. And once again, it's got the expert and he's a weirdo. And I don't agree with what he did. So, I mean, I, I don't know. It's, it's a good, I think it's a good episode in that it, it covers, it's another like rip from the headline, which was a popular topic at the time that, you know, the police were doing these deep surveillance and what they were using in the thing. And basically protocol was changing. And that, I think that's an interesting portion of it. I don't have any problems, obviously, with Duddy killing Dykstra and all those people because they were going to kill him. And, you know, he was just protecting himself. And Dykstra was a jerk anyway. I mean, he was just going around <laughs> shooting everybody. But, you know, I can I also understand why the, the team was mad at him because they felt like he was double crossing them. He's supposed to be that he used to be a cop. But at the same time, Castillo says it. You can't trust him. If you're going to use them, you have to rein them in. So I guess they shouldn't have been too surprised that he went off on his own. Once again, Crockett, you should have <laughs> known it was your fault. No, <laughs> You're the one that recommended him. <laughs> <laughs> I could give like a long ranting speech, but I'm just going to try and keep this really short when it comes to my final thoughts, because I've mentioned this a few times throughout the rundown. I really loved this episode. I loved every minute of it up until the last three minutes of it. I thought it was great that they had Duddy and he didn't know what was happening. He didn't know whose side he was on. He didn't know that he found himself accidentally in the middle here. And then when he does, like, yeah, okay, maybe he strings it out a little bit, but he does try and do the right thing. And he tries to do the right thing constantly without saying or introducing anyone that he happens to accidentally be in the middle. So I have no problem with how Duddy acts in this. What I don't like is that at the very last minute, in the three last three minutes of this episode, there's a political statement by Miami Vice talking about hackers, essentially. And it's like hackers that we think of nowadays when it comes to computers at this era, it was telephones because not everyone had computers in their house. There wasn't an internet that they could connect to and they could break into systems. Maybe some government systems but for the most part everyone had phones in their house and these 
secret cameras and phones and wiretaps and all this stuff was a hot button topic, like you mentioned, Melissa. So he's essentially a hacker. And this political statement right at the very end, where the police are willing to ask for people to hack into big systems like modern day hacking the networks and phones and computers and stuff, but then they damn the people that do this kind of work. If you're not working with the police, then you're the devil. And that's what this boils down to at the very end. That's what drove me crazy. And it's mostly because I'm looking at it through a modern lens. It's because we vilify these people who do this kind of research and know how to do these types of things. Unless the police come to you and ask you to do it for them, then you do it for only them and only for their interests. Otherwise, they're going to make you out to be a villain for anyone who wants to do this kind of thing. And I didn't think Duddy did anything wrong. And Sonny's response at the end really threw me for a loop. I'm still spinning. (laughs) I'm still spinning around from how sunny was at the end of this episode. And like I said, though, I really loved this episode up until the last couple of minutes. So I'm willing to forgive him because I really liked it. John, what are your final thoughts? I had two things that I really thought of watching this episode. One, uh, I got to give Vice credit. Every once in a while, they let one of the guys, because I mean, Dykstra's the bad guy in the episode. But then, like you're saying, they kind of turn... Duddy into a little bit of a villain himself. Vice lets themselves get the wool pulled over them their eyes, and then Duddy gets away with it. Not a lot of shows let the good guys lose every once in a while. I do appreciate a good taking advantage of the gold ability of Miami Vice by Duddy. My my other thought is is I said it like I said at the beginning of the episode, kind of felt like this episode needed like a episode of law and order at the end of it you know <laughs> uh, the, going back to the last three minutes of the breakdown when you and melissa started arguing back and forth about whether or not <laughs> duddy was a had done anything criminal or was a good guy and all of this i could just see as this episode ended an episode of law and order starting and it's like like the district attorney trying to prosecute duddy and Duddy's fence making Dominic's argument, you know, <laughs> that legally you didn't break anything wrong and it goes goes all across. It's somehow at, at, at the end we were taken down. We end up in an investigation about someone killing kids or something. I don't know how <laughs> law and order always does it. it. It almost made me feel like it needed the legal aspect to, to follow up at the end here because I kind of felt the same way as Dominic. He didn't actually break any laws. But at the same time, he was definitely playing both sides and doing it for money. He can't feel all warm and fuzzy that he got away with it at the end. But at the same time, Crockett doesn't have a leg to stand on either. I think it was a good episode uh, all in all. Yeah, I think, you know, I know, Melissa, you weren't necessarily think it was as good as we thought it was. But I think we have a pretty good episode of ice here so and that's gonna do it for us this week we hope you enjoyed this episode of miami vice and go with the heat we would love to hear from you email us go with the heat at gmail.com or tweet at us at go with the heat let us know what your thoughts are on this episode and let me know what your thoughts are on the modern parallels that i've talked about when it comes to hacking phones or computers let me know what your thoughts are on that email me go with the heat at gmail.com or tweet at us go with the at go with the heat make sure to check out the website go with the heat.com you can find all the show notes the music videos to all the music and you can find our feeds that i mentioned that we have a separate feed that's just for the music segment so if you want to get just that you can subscribe to the feed if you want to get just this week in vice We have a feed for that as well. Dedicated feeds just for those shows. Go check it out. GoWithTheHeat.com. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And we'll see you all next time. Bye, pal.